The Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive, is just one piece of Sega's spectacular hardware history, but the Genesis arguably remains its most popular console even decades after its original release. But unlike Nintendo and Sony, miniaturized clone Genesis consoles from companies such as At Games have existed for ages, allowing people to relive the glory days with relative ease. The problem is they're almost universally awful. This time, however, Sega is releasing a new take on the mini console in the form of the Sega Genesis Mini. By teaming up with the legendary M2, Sega seems to be doing everything right leading up to this release. From the design of the unit itself, to the emulation and software selection, everything was carefully considered in building this small shrine to the Genesis. But just how does it really hold up? That's what we're here to find out. For this video, Sega of America provided this unit for testing, and since I grew up in North America anyways, I'll be referring to it as the Sega Genesis. So how did it turn out? Well, there's good and bad news, so let's just jump right in. Sega's 16-bit Genesis first arrived in the late 80s, and while it got off to a slow start, it would eventually go on to challenge the almighty Nintendo, fighting for its spot in the game console world. This was a time when bringing the arcade home was still something companies were fighting for, and the Genesis delivered impressive results, but really, it was the success of games like Sonic the Hedgehog, which elevated Sega to the next level, if you will. After falling in love with the system myself, I've never stopped playing or collecting for it, yet for many people it's been decades since they last held the little red and black gamepad. Which is why when discussing many consoles like the Genesis Mini, the form factor is so critical. You want to channel that nostalgia with hardware that looks and feels just right, but smaller. Thankfully, there's a great attention to detail in its physical design, and it's here where Sega takes things further than the competition in the mini console race. The main thing, every button and panel on the system works in some fashion. It truly looks and feels like a tiny version of the original console. That's right, the power switch, the reset button, and the volume slider all press and move, even if the volume slider doesn't actually do anything. In addition, the expansion port cover is removable, though there's nothing inside, while the main cartridge slot even has working flaps. Controllers are USB, of course, but the ports on the console still resemble a real Genesis to a degree, at least in terms of proportions, as opposed to the flap design of the Super NES Mini. It even has the appropriate holes for attaching a Sega CD, a non-working version of which is available in certain markets. So yeah, most of these features are non-working, but it's a nice attention to detail that helps it feel more authentic. The controllers themselves are solid, perfectly replicating the look of the original three-button pads, though I feel the D-pad is a tad stiff and the plastics feel noticeably different. Some folks are disappointed that Sega didn't include the six-button pad with the Western release of the Mini, but as I feel nostalgia plays a huge role in a product like this, I can understand the choice of the three-button pad, since that's what most people probably grew up with. Now, inside. The Mini is powered by the mysterious all-winner-based Zuiki Z7213 system on a chip, a chip on which little information is available. It's likely comparable to Nintendo's recent Mini offerings, I'd wager, but it's not exactly clear how far the capabilities really extend. It also features 512 megabytes of flash memory, which stores the included games, in addition to HDMI video out, which delivers 720p 60Hz output, along with a micro USB port for power. All basic stuff to be sure, but it's a well-made little package and my favorite of the mini consoles yet. Once you hook it up to your display then, you're presented with a simple clean menu. Games are presented in a large grid format, 
and by changing your language in the options menu, the covers change as well between the different regions. There's also a nice spine view here available which highlights one of my favorite details. When looking at the Japanese Mega Drive selection, Super Fantasy Zone is presented as a smaller case, just like the real thing, while Road Rash receives a slightly thicker box design, again, like EA cases in Japan. It's this attention to detail that I feel separates M2 from the rest, and it really shows here. Speaking of attention to detail, when you change the language, it's not just the box art that changes, you also get different region variants of each game. The inclusion of multi-region ROMs is important, as in this case, there are noticeable differences between different regions. The Japanese version of Dynamite Heady, for instance, features additional story elements, different artwork, and less punishing difficulty overall. Contra the Hardcore is easier as well in its Japanese form. It's neat to be able to switch between them on this system. It's even better with games like Sonic the Hedgehog 1, which features enhanced parallax scrolling in the Japanese version of the game. Notice how flat the background is in the US version compared to the Japanese release. Most importantly, if you choose to play using the PAL region, the games do run at 60Hz rather than 50Hz, so you don't need to deal with slower gameplay or judder as a result of 50Hz output being resampled to 60Hz like they were on the PlayStation Classic. Expectedly, in the settings menu there are three selectable video options, a pillar boxed mode, a stretched 16x9 mode, and a CRT filter for both. So the Genesis, then, can output different resolutions, but the most common we saw are 320x224 and 256x224, the latter of which is the same as Super NES, PC Engine, and other systems of this era. Most games are 320 pixels wide, and here the Genesis Mini seems to perform a 3x3 scale without linear filtering, so pixels are razor sharp and scrolling is free of shimmering. When using the wide mode, however, a 5x scale is used on the horizontal axis filling the screen, but the vertical is now slightly stretched, resulting in uneven pixel scaling. Basically, for every 4 Genesis pixels using a 3x scale, the 5th pixel instead uses 4 pixels. This results in visible lines across the image while scrolling vertically. There's also these visible pixel artifacts present across certain lines, which suggests a variability to the scaling algorithm. It's a tad bizarre and slightly distracting, I have to admit. For 256 pixel wide games, however, the results are rather different. When in wide mode, a perfect 6x scale is used on the horizontal, while the vertical resolution exhibits the same issue noted earlier. The pillar box mode, however, now has issues on these games, with scaling alternating between 4 and 5x between every few pixels, resulting in very obvious shimmering during scrolling. So why would you even want to use the wide mode to begin with? After all, aspect ratio is very important for classic games. Well, there's two reasons. Firstly, you could use your TV's built-in controls to adjust to a proper 4x3 aspect ratio if you're using a flat panel. Or in this weird edge case, you can hook up the Mini to a proper CRT computer monitor for silky smooth scrolling action. To achieve 4x3, however, you'll need to use the wide mode combined with monitor adjustments to stretch the image to fill the screen. There's also the CRT filter, which I have to admit is pretty lousy. This is the most disappointing feature, as it simply blurs and filters the image while applying these weak scan lines. It's really not a great implementation, and honestly, I wouldn't suggest using it. So, in its release form, scaling isn't quite perfect in every mode, but if you want to minimize scaling issues, most games play best using the default pillar boxed mode. For 256 pixel wide games, however, such as Wonder Boy and Monster World and Monster World 4, you'll want to use the wide mode coupled with manual TV adjustment. So, the hardware is nicely made, the user interface is simple and polished, while the scaling options are fairly limited but still acceptable. But what about the games and the emulation itself? Well, with M2 at the helm, I expected great things from this mini console, and the end results are indeed mostly excellent, but there are a few nitpicks to address. 
Sega Genesis Mini is designed around a software emulation solution engineered by M2. They have a lot of history when it comes to developing emulation solutions for classic games, and I feel it was the best choice Sega could have made for this project. Previous consoles in this space from At Games have failed miserably to offer solid emulation. How bad are we talking? Well, the original units were certainly bad enough, but they were at least kind of playable. But the latest unit is one of the worst things I've tested on Digital Foundry. It basically runs every game on the system or from cartridge at roughly 40 frames per second with frame skipping. Most Genesis games are designed to run at 60 frames per second in comparison. Now this is the European unit of course, so perhaps there is some hack implemented to deal with PAL conversions, but even NTSC games are impacted. Everything runs terribly. Beyond this, the sound remains equally awful with tinny, poor playback like this. Just listen to the ring sound in Sonic. It's astonishingly bad. So, in that sense, the Genesis Mini from M2 and Sega is a massive step in the right direction. But that doesn't mean there aren't a few quirks to discuss. Let's start where the Mini succeeds above all else, visuals. Aside from the scaling options mentioned earlier, there thankfully isn't much to complain about here. Each of the games included features relatively accurate visual emulation, so all the tricks used in games such as Gunstar Heroes, or Contra the Hardcore, work exactly as you would expect. Unsurprisingly, M2 has opted not to emulate or display the base color, which manifests as a colored border on real hardware, and the same goes for the CRAM dots. You know, those flashing pixels you'd often see in Genesis games, often along the bottom of the screen. This was simply the result of a hardware quirk when reading or writing to CRAM during active display, basically. Not displaying them does make for a more appealing image, especially on a flat panel TV without overscan, but it's technically less accurate. The two-player split-screen mode in Sonic the Hedgehog 2 also works correctly, displaying pretty much like most PC emulators, that is at full 60 frames per second without interlacing or combing artifacts. This is technically less correct, I suppose, but again, it's more visually pleasing. Overall, I'd say it's a solid representation of the Genesis experience from a visual perspective. There are no glaring bugs or issues with the display, and the games look exactly as you would expect when emulated on a modern flat panel display. Where we start to run into some issues, however, is with the audio. Emulating Genesis audio has long proven difficult, and this challenge is increased by variation between various models of the original hardware. So. How does M2 fare here? Well, overall, the results are not bad, but I feel that certain tracks are a little off. Comic Zone is a good example of this. Many different emulators out there fumble with this specific track. Take a listen. Hear the difference? The percussion in certain games also sounds a little bit strange to me, such as in Thunder Force 3. There's sort of a tinny, harsher sound on the Genesis Mini. Take a listen. though it's a tricky thing to discuss due to the variation in original hardware, but this doesn't sound quite right to me. 
Still, for the most part, games sound pretty good. Streets of Rage 2 is certainly a highlight. sounds pretty good, but the Mini is definitely lacking some of the clarity and bass of the original hardware. But there's more. There's another issue, and that is sound delay. Basically the time between when a sound should play and when it plays in the Mini has been extended. This was also an issue with the NES Classic and the like, and it's every bit as annoying here. Honestly though, despite these flaws, it's still light years beyond the units from At Games. I was reminded just how terrible these can sound while testing the Mega SG earlier this year. The Mega SG, of course, sounds much better than the Genesis Mini overall, but you'd expect that. Now the newer At Games units definitely sound a bit better. But some games, such as OutRun, are still completely broken, with both visual bugs and slow, broken sound. Just look at this. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Still, if we bring our attention back to the matter at hand, the Genesis Mini, audio isn't really a strong point of the system, but it's solid enough and most games sound pretty good. I never truly expected M2 to match original hardware, especially the more sought after revisions. So in that sense, they met expectations, but it's really the sound delay that's more disappointing. But then again, if you're not really used to playing these games on original hardware, you may not even notice it at all. But there's one other key issue to address, input latency. Now, this is a common problem with most of the system on a chip emulation boxes, and it's certainly an issue here as well. Basically, from what I can tell, input lag is increased over the original hardware by several frames or so. So every single game feels a little heavier than you might like. Even when playing the mini on a CRT like this, the input lag is quite noticeable. That said, I mostly play these games on original hardware using a CRT, so the difference for me feels more significant than it might for others. At the very least, input latency is reduced compared to the recent Genesis collection that was released for current generation consoles. Now that was sluggish. Still, for my money, this is what hurts the system the most. Input just isn't as crisp or responsive compared to the real thing. Now, you get used to it after a while, but it never feels as good as it should. Then again, if you were okay with the NES or Super NES Classic, the results here are quite comparable, so it's not necessarily a deal breaker there. It's just something you really should be aware of. So that's most of what I encountered then while testing the emulation. M2's emulation efforts are solid here, but not spectacular. The mild sound issues, sound delay, and input latency all add up to something that isn't quite as polished as I had hoped. But at the same time, for most users, this likely won't be an issue. As I noted, it's comparable to Nintendo's mini console efforts, so if you were fine with those, this should be just fine as well. But there is one other area where the Genesis Mini comes out on top of all the competition, 
and that's game selection. Sega's 16-bit Super Console features one of the most varied and enjoyable game libraries one could ask for, and in building the Genesis Mini, the development team sure made a lot of great decisions. That's right, Sega poured a lot of love and effort into licensing and selecting an amazing lineup of games. Not everything you might want is in here, mind you, but it's hard to argue with what is included. Many of Sega's best first-party titles are present and accounted for. The first two Sonic games had to be there, of course, but stuff like Shinobi 3, one of the finest action games ever made, really adds to the overall package. Monster World 4 is also included, a game I finally finished on original hardware earlier this year. This version even features the English translation that was done for the digital download version released a few years back, which is great. Of course, Streets of Rage 2 is there, which remains a classic, as is Gunstar Heroes from Treasure. More importantly, Treasure's secret best Genesis game, Dynamite Heady, is also included, an absolute gem of the game. Then there's the Konami stuff like Contra and Castlevania, both of which are rather pricey in their original form, and stand as two of the best action games on the Genesis. Alicia Dragoon is another great choice, a unique action platformer game from Game Arts, the studio behind Lunar and Grandia, and a supporter of the Mega CD. And how could I forget Earthworm Jim? I'm a huge fan of this one and the Genesis version is excellent. Even with the input latency, I was able to make it through the underwater tunnels in the glass bubble. But then there's the three rather uncommon games included. Mega Man The Wily Wars, Tetris, and Darius. Mega Man or Rockman Mega World is an interesting conversion of the first three Mega Man titles from NES ported by Minakuchi Engineering the development house behind the Game Boy Mega Man games, which I adore, and much of Mega Man X3. While it has its flaws, and I'm not a huge fan of the music conversion, it's a neat release as the first three games enjoy a full 16-bit makeover. That means an increased color palette, parallax background scrolling, minimal flicker, and various other niceties. It looks pretty darn nice, I think. In its original form, it was released on cartridge in Europe and Japan, which is the version I own, but the US only received it via the Sega channel. Then there's Tetris, basically a conversion of Sega Tetris from the arcade, and I covered this back in my DF Retro Tetris episode. This one was made for the Japanese Mega Drive, but only a small handful of copies exist, making this perhaps the most expensive Mega Drive game in existence. So it's neat to see this preserved on the Genesis Mini as well though don't expect that to influence the prices for an original copy. Lastly, there's Darius. There has been a lot of hearsay over who developed this conversion, but either way, this is a full port of the original Darius to the Mega Drive, or Genesis. The sequel received an original release on the system, but not Darius 1, though it did exist on the PC Engine. Either way, it's neat having this available as well, and makes for a good choice. And really, that's just scratching the surface. This is such a great lineup of games and there's so many games to dive into. For me at least, the two big omissions here though are of course Sonic the Hedgehog 3, which would be nice to have, and Rocket Knight Adventures, which is just a phenomenal game. But still, what's here is great. And with that, we've reached the end of another DF Retro review. My final takeaway is that the Genesis Mini is a fun way to relive one of the best consoles ever made, but it has its caveats. Between the slight input and audio delay, the lack of perfect scaling options, it's really not exactly what I'd hoped, but it's still a solid product overall that I can definitely recommend. If you grew up with the Genesis and haven't played it in a while, this is a great solution. And in fact, it's better than any other mini console released by Sega and indeed the various Genesis collections as well. If you're just looking to casually enjoy the system, this is a great way to go. But if you're a little more serious, I might suggest looking into something like the Analog Mega SG, which is a more all-encompassing solution designed to play real carts. Both products are excellent, but obviously aim for very different markets. With the low price of the Genesis Mini, it's really a no-brainer if you just want some quick Sega Genesis action. But 
that's gonna do it for now. If you enjoyed this video, as always, be sure to like and subscribe, ring the notification bell, and of course, follow us over on Twitter. And until next time, stay retro.